Kelly was bored. Growing up in a quiet Amish town in northeastern Ohio in the 1970s, she was always on the hunt for excitement. Meeting Dace was an unexpected thrill. Home from the U.S. Navy, this handsome young musician shared his drugs, his music, and his experiences beyond her naivete. She never dreamed that behind this charming facade hid a misogynist eager to take control of her life. How devastating. Hit in the head and told she was worthless. That took a toll on her life and she felt helpless and hopeless. Now many of you are going to relate to Kelly's story and you're going to love hearing how she went from victim to victor. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Grant. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Graham. Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope, Kelly. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to hear your story. I know that, as I mentioned in the beginning, many people are going to relate with this story on several different different levels, and whether they came from an Amish community or not. And I know that you have had the same experience of how you have been able to relate to people who have grown up or who have uh, been abused. And so the, the audience is going to be vast that you are going to be able to address today. And I really appreciate you coming on to the show. Kelly Stigliano is going to share her story from a pregnant teen bride to a brainwashed wife, begging God to kill her abuser. As life became more dangerous, she had to flee to protect herself and her two small toddlers. So Kelly, what I would appreciate if you would do is to start from the beginning and share a bit about growing up and then take it from there into when you were a teenager and what happened. Okay, thank you. Well, growing up um, in Northeastern Ohio, my life was like every other child. It was good. And then I started uh, requesting and receiving toys that dabbled with the supernatural. And through those toys, I welcomed rebellion into my heart. So it stands to reason that by the time I was 13, I was very interested in witchcraft. I hated my parents. I, I was involved in drinking and drugs and vandalism and sex. And sometimes I was suicidal. Now, I'm surprised that in that particular community that you grew up in, that you had access to these supernatural toys. Can you explain oh. that a bit? Sure. That was like um, the Ouija board and the eight ball and a game called Kabbalah. And those are just things that they advertised on television. And I suppose my parents bought them at Kmart. Living like that made me hate my life and my and myself. So 13 is pretty young to start a list of regrets. My relationship with my ex-husband began when I was just 17 years old. And he was my, my friend's uh, brother. He get, was home from the Navy. And I'd been hearing about him for years. And finally, I met this bad boy icon. And I was his <laughs> girlfriend. He did and said things that gained my confidence. And then he would do and say things that smashed me down again. And this building up and smashing down mm. was the initial step in my brainwashing. And when I was 17, he made me get off of the birth control pill because he said it, he thought it would cause cancer. And I believed it was because he was actually concerned about my health. He broke up with me the summer before my senior year, and I didn't realize it, but he was testing me to see what I would do. Hmm. Mental manipulation, head games, crazy ups and crazy downs. 
So I was 18 and pregnant when we got married, and I'm sure it was according to his plan. We lived in a little two-room apartment that was built off of my grandparents' garage. It had originally been built for my great-grandparents way back in the day, so it had no bathroom. So it was a <laughs> chilly walk through their it was a chilly walk through their garage to use their facilities. Two weeks after the wedding, I asked him something about his grandmother, and it upset him. And he screamed at me, and he slapped me, and left me standing there shaking. But then I was thinking about what I had said. I knew I had a smart mouth and I thought maybe I should not have asked him that, you know, and by the time I had uh, talked myself out of it, I, I, I thought surely I deserved to get slapped and surely it would never happen again. But as you can imagine, it did indeed continue. My grandmother was everything to me and but yet I never told her about the abuse. Not long after we were married, grandpa got sick and went into the hospital. And then the worst thing of all happened. My beloved, unconditionally loving, sweet grandma died right there at home in her bed. And I, when I lost my grandma, I lost my, my neighbor, my landlady, my best friend, my support system. My husband hit me when I was pregnant. And when he hit me when I held our newborn daughter, I realized that he couldn't or wouldn't control his temper. Fear defined my life and I saw no way out. And like you said, I would pray to a God that I was yet to meet personally. I would beg, God, he's out there driving drunk. It's raining. Please just let him slide off the road and hit a tree. Let him have an accident and die. Mm -hmm. Please kill him or give me the courage to do it myself. I'd often fantasize about hitting him in the head with a frying pan or a baseball bat when he was passed out after a night of drinking or drugs. But I was so afraid I wouldn't hit him hard enough or he'd wake up and kill me. Well, my grandparents' soul, house sold. Grandpa died uh, two weeks after my grandmother and um, in the hospital, and my grand, my, their house sold, and we had to move. We never had any money. We had plenty of new guitar strings and lots of marijuana, but we never had any money. I couldn't figure it out. When my parents went to work, I would go to their house and steal food out of their pantry and do my laundry in their basement. Did you ever tell your parents about this? I never did because, you know, I had this beautiful baby girl, and she was like the glue that brought the family back together. And we were finally getting along because of this baby. And I didn't, run, I didn't want to rock the boat. So I never really told them. And they might have suspected it, but they never asked me. And so it was just never, never something we talked about. And when did you realize that you were an abused woman? Well, that was actually a very, very sad day when I, I just realized it. Um, because I had always been a real firecracker of a child that adults had to deal with, you know, and I, I was a rebellious <laughs> teenager and I was this really spicy little girl. And then I realized one day that I was always afraid and I was walking on eggshells because I would think everything was going well. And then like there would be no incidents for a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden he would have an explosion and tell me about how terrible everything had been for the last two weeks. And I, and I was so confused because I didn't, I thought things were going well, you know? So when I actually realized that this was something that wasn't going to pass, I guess is when my daughter was a baby, it just kind of hit me that this is life. This is what I'm living with. And I felt really trapped. Did you have friends that were going through anything similar or that you could talk, who you could talk to? Well, that's the thing about an abuser, isn't it? They kind of isolate you. So I had no friends. All the friends I had in high school weren't really part of my life. Um, unless they were his party friends. And then they would only come over to party with him. And I really didn't see my relatives much either because there's that um, determined isolation to keep me away from everybody. And he was pretty successful at that. I just want to fast forward for a second here to ask you a question, but we'll come back to the story some more. And that is, sure. is this a pattern basically that you, now that you're helping women in the same situation, is this virtually the same pattern each time. You mean as far as the men's behavior? Yes. Often, often it is. And sometimes women tell me how incredibly charming their husbands are in social situations. I mean, my husband was, was very charming, but we were never really in social situations. I mean, I've heard of women in church and their husband is like an upstanding fella in church and, and they're really not like, like a closet monster. And yeah. Would you say that uh, this is more like a narcissist behavior? I think so. You, all right. Anything else you want to share about your story? Just what you were feeling, what you were trying to think might be an escape for you. Uh, anything more about your story before we go on? I saw no escape. I had this wonderful bulldog and he was my best friend all day, 
every day. And I would cry on him and he would put his big old paw on my shoulder. And he Aww. was the best. He was the best. He was just my best friend. And he loved my daughter and protected her as a tiny child. And yeah, that was really all I had. What I had at the time was a delightful bulldog. That's all I had. Well, that's even more than what some people have, right? I mean, I know you cried in her into her fur, right? <laughs> yes, his fur. Yes. His fur, sorry. Okay. Yes, and some people don't even have that. Exactly. Okay, so now you are realizing that you are abused. You are. Did you make a plan? Like, what was the next step and how to get out of it? I did not make a plan because I didn't have, in my mind, I probably did, but in my mind at the time, I didn't have anyone I could turn to. So my only plan was begging this God who I was yet to meet personally to kill him or to try to get the courage myself to do it. And I never was able to do that. And thank God that was not a prayer that the Lord ever answered for me. <laughs> I'd probably be in jail right now. So no, oh. I never had a plan, I'm afraid. Okay. So what, what happened? Well, after I had baby number two, um, he got mad and quit another job and he went out West to look for work. And when he did, well, when he did, I moved in with my, my daughter and I moved in with my parents and that summer I had baby number two. Okay. And then he, and he had us come live with him in Phoenix, Arizona. That's where he got a job. Okay. And we lived there for seven and a half violent months. And after the worst night of violence, one of my neighbors said, you need to go back home to Ohio where you belong before something really tragic happens. So how, I did, how did your dad, neighbor know what was going on? Because they could hear it. It was oh, an apartment complex. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes I had a black eye and yeah, they couldn't, they just knew. I did leave him one time when I was in Arizona. I went to a battered women's shelter with both of my toddlers. And that was only for one weekend because he cried me back home and told me everything would be fine. And of course it was not. Mm -hmm. So, so when my neighbor said, you need to go home to Ohio where you belong before something really tragic happens, I called my dad at his new job and you know, in 20 minutes, the airplane tickets were waiting for us at the airport. When you live in rebellion, you don't uh, love yourself very much. Right. Therefore, you feel like no one else could love you either. Right. But now I knew for sure that my parents really did love me. So they, they brought the kids and I back to Ohio. And that really wasn't the end of it. I mean, I went to business school. I was getting my life together. And I came home from business school one day. And there sat Stace on my doorstep with everything he owned, which was a guitar and a guitar case and a duffel bag full of his clothes. And he said he said he changed again. And I believed him again and took him back again. And how long was that separation that time? Less than a year. Okay, so long enough for you to establish a new life. Yes, and I was starting to actually regain my self-confidence and I was starting to find independence because I had gone from being my parents' child to being this abused wife and I never really had any time of independence. And so that was I was really starting to come into my own and to enjoy my life and then I allowed myself to be put right back in that position again. So you bought the lie. I did. And what about your parents? Did they try to talk you out of it? They were so disappointed, um, but they, you know, said, whatever you want to do, we just, we're just keeping our eyes on your children. Don't let anything happen to them is mainly what they were thinking, I think, at the time. And um, eventually, um, it got really bad, and they did help the children and I leave, and that was the last time. That was the last time. I don't know why they would have believed me that I was actually leaving him this time, but for some reason they did. And they helped us. They, they bought the kids and I a brand new mobile home out in the country. And so they moved the kids and I into that and, and Dace went back to, to Phoenix and then he did fly back for the divorce, but that was the end. Were you concerned that he would look for you or did he try to find you? Or He flew back to, to Phoenix. So he knew where I was in Ohio and he did try to stop the divorce from long distance. That really was hard. And it was, you know, of course, expensive because he kept stopping the divorce. But when he did finally come back, um, we did have the divorce and then he went back out West and he was pretty much, well, we did communicate for a while through the mail. He never paid child support. He was, he was even abusive through the mail in his words. It showed me what, what he was like and it mm -hmm, you know, was mm -hmm. a test if I was going to put up with it anymore. But then eventually he just dropped off the face of the earth. And how did your children respond to all this? 
Well, you know, when, when we came home from, when I picked him up from the babysitter's house, when I came home from uh, business school that day and um, he was sitting on my doorstep, they were so excited to see him. Oh, daddy. And you know how children are. They're very forgiving. Yeah. Um, and so by the time he really left, you know, they just really didn't say a lot. They were still little. They didn't really say a lot. Um, I think that they were probably lonely for him, but they were probably um, mm. glad the fighting was over. But to be honest with you, I was so consumed with my own issues. I didn't probably give attention mm-hmm. that a child mm-hmm. in that position needed. Well, we're going to take a short break. And then what I want to discuss, and I know you really want to share, and that is what women like yourself can do, what tools they have, and how they can get out from these kind of situations. And we're also going to talk about your memoir, which I absolutely love the title, called Praying for Murder, Receiving Mercy. (laughs) Okay, so we'll be right back. Thanks. Carol Graham would like to show you the path from misery to miraculous triumph in her fast-paced memoir, Battered Hope. She relates her determination to succeed as someone who experienced one horrendous nightmare after another. Gang raped and left for dead, loss of a child, husband falsely imprisoned, and cancer. Nothing could break her tenacity or faith. No matter what you face, heartache, loss, suffering, or injustice, Carol will illustrate how she became a victor the same way you can. The secret is to never ever give up hope. Order your copy at Amazon or batteredhope.blogspot.com. Well, I appreciate the story you shared today so far, and I know that many women relate, whether they're going through it right now or possibly have in the past, or they know somebody who is. So is there anything else you want to say about that before we go into the next part of the show? There is. There is. just people's perception. Um, sometimes people hear about a woman or, or, or they know someone who won't leave her abuser and, and they wonder why she stays. They may think she's stupid or lazy, but please hear me now. It's not as easy as you might think. You can only be hit in the head and and, and told you are, are worthless and belittled for so long before you believe the lies. You believe that you have no worth and you can do nothing by yourself. And if you even try, you or your family will die. That's the success of brainwashing. It gives the brainwasher control over his victim. So don't be judgmental. It really helps no one. That's an excellent point. So let's talk now about how you and I can identify at-risk relationships. How do we recognize if someone is actually going through something like this? And should we at that point step in and do something? That is such a tricky question because some women are not not meaning to be de- deceiving, but they're just really good actresses because it's a it's a matter of life and death to them to hide their abuse. You know, um, I think that sometimes you can tell by just watching the dynamics between them and their husband, or um, if you happen to raise your hand quickly in front of their face or her face and she winces. I think that's a pretty good tell. Oh wow! Some, yes. Sometimes yes, and sometimes you just you. You just don't know. And, and it would be lovely if she would share that with you. But I think most times they won't. And if you suspect it, you could ask. But that doesn't mean she'll be honest with you mm. that time. So just, I mean, maybe keep them too or whatever. You know, just kind of keep your eye on her because we are our sister's keeper. Can you really say something? And if so, is there like a good way or a bad way of saying something? Well, when women uh, talk to me and they tell me about an abusive relationship, they're usually talking about something that happened in the past, but I'm not sure. So I always just look at them in the eye and I say, are you safe now? And most of the time they will say yes. And I just want to trust that if they aren't safe now, they'll shrug their shoulders or roll their eyes or say maybe Mm. or, you know, blatantly say, no, I'm not. Well, then I guess you can face it head on. 
if you know somebody who is dating someone unpredictable and explosive, it, it's it's never too late to leave. And if she needs help breaking off the relationship, she should, she should secure that first. Maybe she could bring a respected authority figure to accompany her while she's officially breaking up, up with her partner. But if she's married, she still could seek help. She could call someone, make a plan, maybe have a trusted lady friend uh, ready to accept her and her children at a moment's notice. Maybe she could keep pajamas and toothbrushes at her house. Um, and you, as that trusted person, you have to consider, are you willing to be that person? Because there are things you have to consider if you want to involve yourself in someone else's domestic disputes, but I don't think it's ever good to just turn your back on them. At least she could call the Salvation Army. She could call her pastor's wife. She, there are there are so many places that you can call. As a matter of fact, there is a number. It's it's um, thehotline.org. It's a website. It's for the Na National Domestic Violence Hotline. It's thehotline.org, and it's really easy to remember. But, Huter, that is also used by your abuser. You have to be very careful. And that number would be 1-800-799-SAFE. It's easy. 799-SAFE. Just try to remember that. That's excellent. And I think that one of the things we have to be careful for, of if and when we try to help somebody, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, and that is to be in a position where we are not judging. Yes, Carol, that is right. That's right. It's it's. You want her to know that you care, you that you care, and that you're concerned, but not that you think you're better than her, or that you're judging the situation either. Right. Oh, true. That's true. Yeah. So, what would you recommend? I know you touched on it a little bit already. That if someone is going through something like this, and even if they are listening to this broadcast today, what are the steps that they should take to protect themselves and leave? I know you mentioned a couple things, but they also have to be very careful. So is there any suggestions that you have there? Well, when I left, I left while he was at work because I was scared. I'm not if he would have come home and found me leaving, that would have been really terrible. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm not the best person to give that advice. Um, <laughs> I would, I would say definitely have a girlfriend, please find somebody that you can confide in, you know, somebody that you know is tight lipped and isn't going to share your business with other people. And, and like I said, that, that could be just a phone call away, but hopefully you have someone close in your life and then you can, you can sit down and make a plan. And, and because you have to you have to decide when it's time to say enough is enough because you don't want your children harmed. You don't want to live that way. Jesus loves you so much. He liberated women. He doesn't want you to live in, in danger. Now, I know that you've written your memoir, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And you're also a counselor, I believe. I am not a counselor. I work at a, a crisis pregnancy center, but I'm a receptionist. Okay. All right. So you do see a lot, obviously. Yes. And when I, I'm a speaker. And so when I share my testimony, people will come up and talk to me. And that's when they often will tell me that they have been in an abusive situation. And that's the time at which I usually say, are you safe? And you know, it's interesting because when I share, if it's at like um, a country club or a restaurant or whatever, the wait staff is always waiting just on the other side of that doorway listening to me. And sometimes I feel like they're the ones that I'm there right, for. Right. And they will occasionally come up and just give me the look. And I know it's just like the Holy Spirit is showing me, yes, that's what. And then I'll, sometimes I'll say, do you want my book? And, you know, if it's not safe, don't take my book. But if you want my book, just take my book because I'm hoping that it'll help. That's very gracious. And I'm sure that there are many that are will appreciate that. Now, what, what type of organizations do you speak for? Do you travel uh, like just in your area or? Well, through um, Stonecroft is, is a good organization. They uh, I'm a speaker for them, but I'm also a speaker registered with um, womenspeakers.org. So really I, I speak at, I've spoken at, you know, a church, church with men and women. I've spoken at Christian high schools with boys and girls, but mainly I speak just to women like church women groups or, or Stonecroft Women's Connection outreaches. And um, I've, I've been so blessed to have the opportunity to speak to those groups that have in the audience women from transition houses and um, uh, domestic abuse uh, houses and uh, opportunities to speak to women like that. That 
is really my heart. I'm so blessed and grateful when I have those opportunities. I've also been able to go to a couple of homeless shelters, which is, you know, what I say is obviously very different, but um, it's still still the same sort of, I, I just, that's my heart. I feel really excited when I get a chance to do that. Oh, I want you to address something that I believe is a very a crucial, important subject, and that is the subject of forgiveness. Mm. That's right. That is when I when people ask me about writing or speaking, I always say you cannot even think about sharing your story until you can have some forgiveness, because if you sound bitter, then you're Mm -hmm. really not helping Mm -hmm. anyone. And it's like you have to wait until you are completely healed to really effectively share. I mean, write, 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 write everything down. It's cathartic. Don't ever stop writing. Mm -hmm. But just as far as sharing it, maybe you should just wait until you can forgive. And it's not easy to forgive. And it doesn't matter on what level we all struggle with forgiveness. I have spent so much time asking God to help me forgive. I have learned that if I pray for the person I need to forgive, and man, that is sometimes really hard. But if I pray for the person I need to forgive, God will often allow me, eventually allow me to see that person through his eyes, and I will have compassion on that person. And I also learned that if I live as as though I have already forgiven, it can work from the outside in. But I look at it this way. If God can forgive me for the terrible things I've done, I must forgive others. I think, how dare I not? You had several good points there. One is, no matter how much you have been abused, you still have the ability, if you choose to, to forgive. Would you like to expound on that a little bit? Well, I absolutely agree with you. Um, It's long been said that unforgiveness is like sipping poison and expecting the other person to die. You're not hurting the offender. You're only hurting yourself. And there are countless medical publications that say how unforgiveness affects our health. And even forgiveness is associated with improved mood and lower stress, Hmm. lower blood pressure, um, boosted immune system, lower uh, risk of alcohol and substance abuse. You know, it's, it's just so important to forgive. Forgiving someone does not mean that they have to be in your life anymore. Excellent points. In summary, do you have anything you want to say to the audience that you have not yet said? I just want to say that you don't have to accuse your abuser to be free. The way you retaliate is to leave. Help is available. There are organizations that can help you. Like I said, call the Salvation Army, call your pastor's wife. But there are organizations that can help you. You don't need to kill your abuser to leave. The way you retaliate, I mean, you don't need to kill your abuser to get out of your terrible situation. The way you retaliate is to leave. I can't stress that enough because if you're in prison, nobody is nobody's benefited from that. So now tell us about your book. Who should buy it? Is it a novel? Is it appeal to strictly women who have been abused? Or just share us about your book. Well, it's written in two parts uh, with photographs in the middle. The first part is for women in at-risk relationships and the people who love them. The second part is for single moms and the people who love them. But the whole book is really for anybody who needs to embrace forgiveness and receive hope. It is a memoir. It covers eight about eight years of my life. And it's praying for murder, receiving mercy from at-risk to at-peace, my journey from fear to freedom. My journey from fear to freedom. Boy, that's a bumper sticker, right? (laughs) Sounds good, yeah. (laughs) That's excellent. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. And if there's anything else you want to share, otherwise I will just encourage the audience to, first of all, pick up your book, to share this podcast with anyone who they may be concerned about that they may be going through something similar and very often those are family members you know yeah which I'm, I'm sure you're very acutely aware and so to share this this message to share this podcast to pick up your book to connect with you on uh, social media and I know that you're open to questions or people who may be struggling in this area that yeah. uh, they can contact you and share their story and ask you questions it would be private so there are many things here that someone can do to um, protect themselves and to gain maybe a better awareness of what is available to them yes well I didn't say that my book is is available in paperback 
ebook and audio book. Okay, excellent. Read by me. I yammer on for 10 hours. <laughs> that's that's great. That's you must you must have the perfect voice for it. All right. Well, thank you again, Kelly. This has been enlightening. It certainly has been encouraging, I know, for many. And still, when you share your story, you know, from your past, you still have to dredge up that old stuff. (laughs) And it brings it, you know, back to the forefront in some way. It's very evident, because I have interviewed over eight years, I've interviewed a lot of people who have Mm -hmm. incredible stories, and you can tell when they have not forgiven the offender. Mm. So that is very evident in this story that you, there is no unforgiveness and showing that it can happen. We can mm. live free from that. Amen. So thank you again for sharing and we look forward to listening to this again. Thank you. Thank Kelly. you so much, Carol, for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.